Hi, welcome to The Void, the show where I have an existential crisis in public. As I said in my last podcast, I'm doing the most to better myself and to grow as a person. I'm clearly safe enough to change my life for the better, so my brain is like, oh, you want to change? Cute. You can't grow without resolving old pain, so let's clean up this mess first. So basically, right now, I'm in the middle of a trauma resurgence. The thing is, I'm already going through a lot of changes. I already feel like a stranger in my life. And I think that makes it even worse. Not only am I trying to keep myself alive all day, I have to do it next to flashbacks. I don't even know if it was this week or last week. My sense of time has gone to shit, but I was confronted with my past in a very immediate way. And from one moment to the next, I had nightmares. I started lashing out to people that I hadn't spoken to in weeks. Very emotional phone calls. And it took me a while to understand what the hell was wrong with me. And then I kind of looked at it and I was like, wow, I spend more time than not being in a triggered state. I think it's like accumulation of things that drove me to this point. My brain is violently forcing me to process things I hadn't processed yet. I spent a good two thirds of my life trying to feel as little as possible. I could have known that this day would come. It's a lot of work. <laughs> it's so much work. I go to bed at like 10 because I'm exhausted. It kind of feels like my trauma is this entity in the room. It has this heaviness to it that makes daily life way harder than it would normally be if I just repressed it like I have been doing for years. My dumb ass <laughs> thought I was done, but nope. I wasn't actually healing. I was just kind of isolating myself in a way that didn't require me to deal with my past. I do now. I have to now. It's do or die, bitch. So I thought, you know, now I'm working through this, why not turn my pain into power and uh, turn this into something we can talk about? But I wanted to do this episode because I wanted to highlight a side of emotional triggers that people don't really pay attention to in the overall discourse. See, just fucking exhausted. And I'm not the type who considers herself easily triggered. I kind of hate the word. It is so overused that it's just devoid of meaning, like feminism safe space what what's another one neurodiverse all of these buzzwords that become abstract because they're used for things they shouldn't be used for or used in ways they shouldn't be used has this dehumanizing quality to it if we only focus on the word itself and when we implement it and not who it's meant for i think it's important especially with these things that we go beyond the simplicity that social media forces on almost every subject. I really want to go back to basics. Like what is trauma even? What is being triggered? What does it mean? What does it entail? How does it manifest? How do we implement trigger warnings? Why we need trigger warnings? Or if we need trigger warnings? Let's just talk about it all. So trauma is when a terrifying event happens that you have no control over. So it causes psychological changes that outlive the moment that caused them. Trauma can be caused by one significant event or something that happened over the course of time. So for instance, being in a car accident can be just as traumatic as being in a long-term abusive relationship. The length of the actual event doesn't really matter. You should kind of see it as a sensitivity in your psyche. This is where triggers come in. A trigger is a situation or a stimuli that elicits a automatic, uncontrollable emotional response because it reminds you of something that happened in the past. The thing that I find interesting about triggers as a experience expert now is that you respond to them before you consciously know what you're responding to. And that's what makes it so jarring. That's why a reaction to a trigger is so explosive. It seemingly comes out of thin air, also for the person who's experiencing it. And most people don't even understand that they were triggered until they look back at it. And maybe you sent entire walls of text in a panic because you were triggered. It's something you usually see afterwards, not while you're in it. And the thing about triggers is it could be a person, it could be a relationship dynamic, a place, a situation, a smell, a feeling, everything can be a trigger, no matter how innocuous it seems. Because it's a completely subjective experience, it is highly individualized. What sets me off might not have any impact on someone else, even though we might have lived through the same trauma. What all triggered responses have in common is this sense of being out of control intense emotional distress your self-control has left the building there's no negotiating with your own behavior you're just led by it this 
earth-shattering sadness, grief, fear, dread. It can be so intense for some people that they lose track of time or even their sense of self. Triggers can make your emotions super amped up or completely flat or just inappropriate for what the situation calls for. So if your nan kicks the bucket and you're laughing uncontrollably, you're triggered probably. And it can lead to self-isolation or suicidal ideation or just lashing out to people close to you. Being triggered makes you either very angry or very needy or both and it has the potential to burn a lot of bridges. That's also something no one mentions. And it's not just psychological. And yet what surprised me the most about it is the body load, man. Your heart starts pounding or your breath becomes very shallow. For this urge to run, even though there's nothing going on because of course your fight and flight is activated. So you can be sitting on the couch and you can feel this seed of anxiety grow inside your stomach and it makes you want to run. You don't know where to, but you don't want to be where you are. This helpless, panicked, overwhelmed feeling is really dreadful. If I had to describe it, I would describe it as an injury or maybe even like the emotional flu. Feelings are just leaking out of every orifice. Now that I have experienced it, I'm like, wow, people are fucking overusing the word because it's intense, man. The easiest way to understand what someone who is triggered is going through is to think of triggers as a trapdoor to the mind. It's legit like the floor is just pulled from under you. And this is something I also wasn't aware of. Like the aftermath of being triggered can last days or weeks. At the most, it can last a month. Now, why the hell does trauma happen? Explicit memories are the ones that we can recall voluntarily, uh, that we can name, we can describe what's going on. During traumatic events, our brain also encodes another type of memory in parallel for the same event. And these memories are implicit memories. Traumatic memories are, in essence, a conditioned fear response. We all know Pavlov's dog. We start unconsciously associating a seemingly random thing from the environment with the horrible thing that happened. Let's say uh, someone was burning incense in the car before you had a car crash. That scent might send you off. A whole nother layer of memories is formed, a whole nother layer you're not aware of, and that layer is what fucks us up when we get triggered. Triggers are not feeling bad or uncomfortable with hearing about a difficult subject. I mean, of course you're upset when you hear something upsetting, you know? Let's not conflate humanity with uh, pathology. So we've established what triggers are and what they do and how shitty they feel. So what do we do now? What can we do about it? And the thing is, there's no easy fix to them. The only way you can work through them is by being exposed to them. There's a reason why exposure therapy is one of the most effective forms of therapy. By being exposed to things that trigger you, you learn what your triggers are. You learn to understand to what previous experience they are connected. So you can better understand why this particular thing is triggering you so much. And if you understand all of those things, you can learn to manage your emotional reaction to it. And that's where growth happens. It's an inevitable step to growing into yourself and getting to know yourself. And I'm not saying everyone should expose themselves to the things that make them feel horrible, but the way social media now promotes avoidance is not doing anyone any favors. You're going to be dealing with the same thing years from now if you keep avoiding it. Social media frames it as something that cannot be overcome and that is part of your identity. You're traumatized and that's it. There are people who traumatize and people who are not. But again, there's just a loss of nuance. Your trauma is something that you can get over. So you're probably thinking, okay, and that's why trigger warnings are also very useful, right, Jill? To which I say, nah. But the benefits is that you give people the agency to decide whether they want to deal with certain content or not. But, you know, I read a lot about it. There are just way more points against it. It infantilizes audiences. Or like they don't themselves have the ability to hear when something is going to go into a certain direction and turn the thing off themselves. There are a lot of studies that 
considered trigger warnings counter therapeutic so it's actually going against someone's therapy by making them believe trauma is part of their identity making your trauma an important part of your identity can only make it take longer before you can rid yourself of your trauma because obviously if you don't know who you are without the trauma you're not going to feel incentivized to get rid of it the amount of people that have been diagnosed with ptsd in most countries does not exceed six percent think about it all of us are traumatized but only six percent or less than six percent develops ptsd of course there are people who are undiagnosed but the number is not all of a sudden going to rise to 30 percent the fact of the matter is ptsd and the people with ptsd represent a very very small percentage of our society so most people who engage with content with trigger warnings do not have ptsd for the average person trigger warnings don't do anything except for make them feel like trigger warnings are necessary. They start believing that certain information can be dangerous or sensitive and it becomes sensitive to them even if it wasn't before. They basically psych themselves out. What trigger warnings are doing to most people is create vigilance and sensitivity in areas where it's not needed in people who don't have problems in the first place. In a way, trigger warnings kind of promote pathologizing discomfort you are going to be uncomfortable. No one is going to save you from that discomfort. It is your job to learn how to deal with it. And by taking that away from people, you also take away their chance to learn how to deal with it. Now it's being used for the most frivolous of subjects, so it just completely loses its meaning. An example, I reread an old story, it's called I Have No Mouth and I Must Scream. It's dystopian science fiction, I'm very much into that. I like to reread it every couple of years because what the story means changes as I change, so I think it's a, a cute way to measure my view of the world. I reread it and I was like, oh yes, it reminds me of Rocco's Basilisk. Let me kind of Google and see if this is still a thing that people talk about. So I ended up in a video that was about this and it started with a trigger warning. Rocco's Basilisk is a thought experiment about a godlike robot. Okay, in this case, the information would be dangerous. Locos Basilisk is basically a godlike artificial intelligence. Once you know about this artificial intelligence, which you do now, <laughs> you have to help him reach his godlike position in the future. If you don't, you're doomed and it's going to make your life hell. I could spend an hour talking about it. It does not need a trigger warning, okay? It doesn't. We can all agree that a thought experiment does not need a trigger warning because what it implies is that there's something as dangerous thought, which is just that's just a slippery fucking slope and another problem i have with it is that the term forces information in a very tight space in a very narrow frame a frame that is completely defined by trauma and suffering what if we prefaced literary masterpieces with trigger warnings to go mockingbird ulysses uh pff, beloved what if we prefaced it with trigger warning rape sexual assault racism that would be really reductive don't you think it's taking all of these things that make these stories so beautiful and so rich and so interesting and reducing them to a couple of words i don't think it does art any justice at all and the coup de grace of all of this is that trigger warnings are ultimately not effective they can even amplify the anxiety people feel in response to distressing content. Just the mention of trigger warning raises the stakes. Trigger warnings up the chances of someone being triggered more than content without a trigger warning. They are already on edge before they even know what the thing is about or the context it is going to be discussed in. Context is important when it comes to being triggered. Topical information can be triggering, yes. More often than not, it's not. Like I said about the two memory systems, we have implicit and explicit memory. The whole mention of a car crash in itself, there's a very small chance that someone would be triggered by that. The reason being that the thing that triggers us is, is most of the time our implicit memory, and that is our sensoric memory, not in our linguistic memory. Anything can be triggering. The theme song to Full House can be triggering. Seeing a certain color can be triggering. Hardly anyone is triggered just by words alone. Trigger warnings do not work. And even if they did work, we're using them for the wrong things anyway. Okay, 
So if trigger warnings aren't benefiting the people it should benefit, then who is it for? They seem to have turned into a thing that makes the person who implements the trigger warning look good instead of a thing that actually does something or works. It invalidates people who get triggered with a trigger warning. They might think, what is wrong with me? I, I kind of braced myself. I made sure that I was in the right position to receive this information and I'm still triggered. They think it's a, it's a them problem, but it's just a feature, not a bug. There's a bigger chance that it doesn't help you than there's a chance that it does. And I feel like this is just one of those things that happens when the agreement machine, social media, makes people feel like everyone should care about everything at all times, which is also very impossible because our empathy has a limit. Maybe I'll talk about that some other time. It makes a lot of these things very disingenuous. It becomes more of a virtue signaling thing than a thing that is actually concerned with people who are traumatized. So, I'm okay with dealing with it now. I am now in a place where I can work on it without completely caving in onto myself. I'd rather have it happen now than when I found a hot husband and uh, you know get a dog named Pizza. It sounds very dramatic, but I know that when I'm on the other side of this, things will have changed. I of course don't know what yet, maybe the way my life looks or the choices I make or the things I want, but it feels like I'm at the precipice of a new chapter in my life and that's always going to be uncomfortable. These are just growing pains and I accept that. If I was thinking about it, I became a vegetarian, I think it's already a couple months ago. The fact that I just got such a strong aversion to meat came seemingly out of nowhere. If I psychoanalyze myself, I think I'm just trying to distance myself from any kind of pain or I don't want to consume pain because I have enough of it myself right now and that sounds very, very out there. But that is the only explanation I have. I've never had that in my life. Ever. Okay, sure. I'm kind of a diva. I don't like chicken wings and stuff. Things you have to eat off the bone. Ugh. But now I just hate all meat. But I'm not sure what this is, but I'm just going to respect this now. I'm in my soft era. I feel radically gentle and I feel no shame in saying that that is exactly the way I should be treated right now. And I know that doesn't sound like a big deal, but I used to hit people with bike locks, okay? <laughs> so let's just call it growth. I've paid my dues. I've proven my independence and now I'm just embracing my softness. I feel like a Sade song and I'm ready for people to match that energy. And it's not very cool. It's not something you can do TikTok dance to or whatever the hell it is young people are doing on the internet, but it is the truth. And this might be what is going to change the period after this. This transition from this hard ass who really didn't give a fuck about anyone to someone who is, doesn't see it as a weakness anymore. That is a radical shift and I'm glad to make it. Let's just call this uh, an investment in my future. All of this reminded me of existential psychotherapist called Rollo May and he said, one does not become fully human painlessly. And I think that about sums it up. Life is not about avoiding pain. It's about learning to cope with it, learning to accept it, and eventually resolving it. Trauma was never meant to be part of your identity. I described it before as an entity in the room, right? This heavy entity in the room. The point is to rid the space of this entity so there's more room for your growth. You are not your trauma. And that was my take on trauma. I hope it kind of helped you get more of a complete image about what it means to be triggered. We're not trying to make this about my trauma, but just explain what trauma looks like in practice. I felt like it was time for a different conversation about this that is nuanced and that highlights more than personal experience because anecdotal experience is not very helpful and only scientific experience isn't very helpful either. Thanks for tuning in again. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much for subscribing and for following me on podcast platforms and just believing in the vision before I even really know what the vision is. But we can kind of figure it out together, I guess. We can just make it up as we go. And um, I'll see you in the next one. Bye.